Okay, um, in these next couple of videos, we're going to be looking specifically at the nature of Socratic reasoning, and we're going to be uh, paying special attention to um, the Euthyphro dialogue, which is written by Plato. But uh, before we get into the actual content of the dialogue, I'm just going to cover some uh, basic historical aspects here. So, um, so far as we know, the man Socrates never wrote any of his own thoughts down. So the only things that we know about the historical Socrates um, come from other individuals, uh, primarily contemporaries of his. So Plato uh, was a student of Socrates. So a lot of what we know about Socrates comes from Plato, but um, there were other historians in Athens and things like that at the time. Um, uh, which also discuss the you know nature of Socrates views. Um, we have Aristophanes clouds, which is a satire of Athenian society and and in the clouds, um, Socrates doesn't really come off looking all that well. Um, he comes off looking uh, like one of the the sophists who uh, somewhat had a bad reputation. Um, and so this has caused some people to speculate whether or not um, Socrates actually was a historical individual. Um, in Plato's dialogues, he, he comes off as larger than life, obviously, um, given the profound appreciation that Plato would have had for his teacher. But um, if we look in the dialogues themselves, the, the early dia dialogues, the middle dialogues, and the later dialogues, um, in the dialogues themselves, there, there seems to be a pretty good indication that um, Socrates actually was a historical figure. So in the Platonic dialogues, um, Socrates is being used as a character. Um, so in the Euthyphro, the Apology, and the, and the Credo dialogues, um, which center around uh, Socrates' conversation with Euthyphro, the Apology is the uh, Socrates' defense of himself at his trial, and then the Credo dialogue is when Socrates is actually imprisoned, and uh, Credo and some other students come to Socrates and try to get him to escape from prison. Um, in these dialogues, Socrates largely claims to be ignorant of topics related to um, the existence of the afterlife, for example, in the, the Credo, um, in the Euthyphro dialogue, he, he claims to not um, know what piety or, or justice are. You know, he, he says, I am ignorant of such things. Um, and, it, and even in the Apology, he um, mentioned several times that he's not the one claiming to have knowledge. But then in the, the middle dialogues and then the later dialogues in particular, what we have is, is the character Socrates somewhat confidently giving answers to these kinds of questions. Um, and not only giving answers to these kinds of questions, but giving answers to these questions in, in a sort of way that um, the earlier Socrates from the earlier dialogues probably would have disagreed with. So kind of the general view here is that what we have in the earlier dialogues, um, yes, Socrates is being used as a character in a conversation, but um, the actual views being, being described and being expressed can actually be attributed to the historical Socrates. And then when we get into the later dialogues, what we have is Plato continuing to use um, Socrates as a character, but here Plato is using the, the character to express his own views. I mean, this is particularly the case where we're talking about, you know, in the, in the dialogues where we get to Plato's theory of the forms and we get to um, the nature of the transmigration of the soul and the question of the afterlife, questions about how the mind is related to the body, those kinds of things. Um, the historical Socrates largely would have been, oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm here to eliminate possible answers rather than come to the right answer. Um, whereas in these other dialogues, Socrates is saying, oh yeah, well, um, um, there is no learning. Um, it's impossible to um, learn anything new. You know, our, our souls already sort of possess all knowledge and it's the job of the philosopher to awaken us to um, you know, that, that knowledge that we already sort of possess innately, but we've merely forgotten because we're embodied, you know, our souls are weighed down by the, 
nature of the body and things like that. Um, so those kinds of things, you, you don't hear Socrates sort of waxing eloquently on those kinds of topics um, in these earlier dialogues, the Euthyphro, the Apology, and the Credo that you do in the later ones. Okay. No, but um, as far as the historical Socrates is concerned, um, prior to Socrates, uh, most philosophers uh, were interested in this project of cosmology. So um, this is Thales and Anaximander and Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and all the other Anaxes and Pythagoras and Democritus and Heraclitus and Parmenides. Um, and it's at least recorded that when Socrates was younger, he did encounter Parmenides and Zeno, and it and it was through having some initial conversation with Parmenides and Zeno that Socrates kind of got turned off to this project of cosmology. So the the, the pre-Socratic cosmologists were concerned with um, trying to find natural explanations for um, natural events and phenomena and uh, they were trying to uncover concepts of, of substance, you know, that which is fundamental to reality or, or the fundamental nature of reality. So it's, it's not as though Socrates didn't think those questions were important per se, but he seemed to think that questions about what's ultimately real, these might just be beyond our reach. So Socrates shifts his focus away from cosmology to ethics. Um, and in particular, um, what it means to good, live a good life, what is the nature of justice, how do we organize um, a, a just society, and how do we understand um, ourselves as individuals that live within a just society, um, those kinds of things. Um, Socrates was more concerned with how doing philosophy and, and doing philosophy in the right kind of way uh, can possibly contribute to being a just individual or, or living a, a good life. Okay, now, but um, despite moving away from cosmology, um, one sort of facet of all of that that, that Socrates did take with him um, was this important um, notion of testing beliefs for consistency. Um, if there's anything that you see in Socrates' works or, or, you know, or in Plato's works that are historically attributed to Socrates, um, Socrates is, is really concerned with making sure not only that we are using words consistently, but also that we have consistent belief. Now, and this is something that the you know previous pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, and particularly Parmenides and Zeno, were fundamentally concerned with. So, Zeno himself um, has various kinds of paradoxes, you know, paradoxes of of motion, um, you know, and, and just views that we take for granted. You know, so one is the paradox of the arrow. Well, if you consider um, an archer firing an arrow, we ask the question: Does the arrow move? Uh, the common answer would be. Well, yes, of, of course the arrow does. I mean, it certainly seems to move. And Zeno says, okay, well, um, if, if, the, if the arrow is, you know, like a, a tangible, concrete, physical object, well, it, it's got to be located somewhere. Uh, so that seems to be true. We're committed to the idea that, that human artifacts do have spatial location. They have to be located somewhere. Um, but uh, if the arrow is moving, um, it's not going to where it's going, or it's it's not located where it's going. Why? Because it's moving and it hasn't gotten there yet. Um, it's also not located where it's coming from. Why? Because it's moving and it's gone away from where it's coming from. Well, if it can't be where it's going and it can't be where it's coming from, but it has to be located somewhere, it can't be located any at any point in between where it's coming from and where it's going, but it has to be located somewhere. So either uh, the arrow is located or it doesn't move. So if we side with the arrows located, we have to bite the bullet and say, or bite the arrow, uh, and say that the arrow doesn't move. And we, if we say that the arrow doesn't move, we got to say that it's not located, but it has to be located because it's a tangible concrete material object. Now, 
So Zemo's point is not, well, uh, he's not saying by necessity nothing moves per se. I mean, you can read him that way, but his whole point is, look, a, a lot of the ideas that we just take for granted are much more complex and, and ought to be tested. Um, our, our beliefs ought to be tested for consistency. Now, and you can clearly see Socrates um, using this same kind of methodology uh, throughout the dialogues. In the earlier dialogues, in the middle dialogues, you know, and, and this process came to be known as dialectic. So um, the, the, the dialectical process is a matter of asking very specific questions to, to test an individual's views for consistency. So, and the reason why Socrates is a genius is he's almost able to see a web of possible responses that one can give to a, a set of questions when he is asking an initial question. So, you know, if, if Socrates poses a question um, and gives you options A or B, and then you answer A, and then there's another question, you know, to which there are options B and D, if you answer A, and then, you know, E and F if you answer B, and then like there's an entire web of possibilities that breaks down. Well, what Socrates will do is he will take notice of how you answer um, various questions in various places in the conversation, and then he will point it out where your views are inconsistent. So in this web of possibilities, if you answer A, um, D, and then you know break down and eventually you answer J, uh, well, what if the conjunction of A, D, and J is an inconsistent set? Well, that means you have inconsistent beliefs. Now, and the whole idea is if your beliefs are inconsistent, then you can't hold all of these beliefs um, without pain of contradiction. So any beliefs that you have that are inconsistent means that they can't all be true. And if they can't all be true, that means something has to give here. Now, so what Socrates will do is he won't tell you what the truth is. Um, and and this, this frustrates people that talk with him incredibly. Um, I mean, and particularly in book one of The Republic with, you know, uh, Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus just says, you're, you're just here to trick us. You know, you're, you're a spinster of words. You're... You know, the contemporary terminology would be you're not engaging in conversation in good faith here. You're, you're just trying to trip us up. So in book one of the Republic, Thrasymachus is particularly frustrated by the fact that Socrates is dismantling everybody else's answers, but not providing his own answers. Um, but and that can be frustrating with Socrates. But but here's the point. And, and I I think even to this day, I'll good philosophy can be done this way. Um, philosophy is not so much about asking questions to get to the right answer per se. Philosophy is just as much about eliminating possible answers. Now, and by eliminating possible answers, we actually do approximate towards the truth. So knowing what the wrong answers are won't entail that we know what the what what the right answer is or what the right answers are but as we eliminate possible answers as as we eliminate wrong answers as as we do that as we engage in that kind of process we do get closer to the truth you know to to borrow some description from philosophy of science here so knowing what the answers can't be do help us to understand what the answers potentially are. I mean, so so think of medical diagnostics. Um, as we, you know, you, you, you go into a physician's office with a set of symptoms, and we start with a list of, you know, ailments or conditions that those symptoms are consistent with. Okay, well, you present with these kinds of symptoms. Um, well, it could be any number of these conditions. So then what will we do? We will start testing for those conditions that are consistent with your symptoms. Now, so, you know, if, if you do like a whole blood panel and you, 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 you know, you, you get an EKG and, and the, uh, uh, 
and all this all this testing done and your doctor comes in and says well we've got good news we we know what's not wrong with you you know we know it's not this 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 um I mean, give your doctor some slack here. Why? Because as you eliminate the possible answers, you get closer to what the right answer actually is. So Socrates seems to understand that here. Now, and that's why he consistently says, I'm, I'm not saying I know what the right answer is. I'm, I'm not the one who's, who's claiming to have knowledge. Um, it's other people that are claiming to have knowledge here. Now, and if you're claiming to have knowledge, um, you should be able to answer a very specific set of questions about what it is that you're claiming to know. Now, and if, if, you, if you claim to have knowledge, but you can't give consistent answers about what it is that you claim to know, I mean, well, since there can't be true inconsistencies, I mean, so again, if your set of beliefs is inconsistent, meaning that it's possible to derive a contradiction from that set, well, that means at least one of your beliefs is false. And false is falsity is incompatible with knowledge. Um, you can't know falsehoods. So you can know that something is false, but you can't know something that is false. So you can't know that the earth is flat. Why? Because there's no fact of the matter. There, it's, it's the statement, the earth is flat, is false. So it's not the kind of thing which even can be known. So truth is a necessary condition for knowledge. So if you claim to have knowledge, but logically some of your beliefs are false, then that means that you don't possess knowledge. At least you don't possess knowledge of everything that you claim to possess knowledge about. Okay. Now, so, and, and this is the kind of thing that Socrates would do, and, and this is what would get him in trouble. Um, there were a couple of individuals who, who Socrates had a notorious reputation for engaging in questioning, okay? So one individual would be individuals who claim to possess knowledge or claim to be wise, okay? So... What's going on in the Euthyphro dialogue is this. Um, in the Euthyphro dialogue, um, Euthyphro is a self-proclaimed expert on the gods. A self-proclaimed expert on the gods. Um, and Socrates is, oh, wow, you are. I mean, so, so Euthyphro would be the equivalent of a, you know, uh, a pastor with, with a master's in divinity, basically, or, or someone who, with an advanced degree in religious studies, I mean, He's got the book smarts, you know, he could, he could tell you stories about the gods that would give you nightmares, that kind of thing. So if you claim to possess knowledge or you claim to be wise, Socrates will test you. He will question you, okay? Now, the other kind of individual that Socrates says he would ask questions of um, would be individuals whom Socrates himself sees as knowledgeable or wise. So if you claim to have knowledge, Socrates will question you. But, but if Socrates thinks of you as a knowledgeable individual, or as he says with um, Thrasymachus you know, in the book One of the Republic, oh, you're very clever. You're, I love the way you answer questions. You know, you're very, uh, you, know, you know, he, he says, I, I really like how thorough you are in answering these, these questions. Oh, you know, maybe I can learn from you. Um, you know, in the Euthyphro dialogue, he says, oh, Euthyphro, let me be your pupil so that I can, I may gain knowledge and wisdom of, of the gods and, and these kinds of things. So if Socrates is impressed with you, he will test you um, for, you know, seeing if you actually possess knowledge or, or seeing if you are actually wise. Okay, now, but this is, again, this is what got him in trouble. Um, if it was discovered that you were neither knowledgeable nor wise, Socrates will point it out to this individual um, on their behalf. So if it turns out through this series of questioning, Socrates is able to point out inconsistencies in your thought processes and, and show you that your beliefs are inconsistent, he will point this out to you. Now, and, and you can hear this being echoed by Thrasymachus in book one of the Republic. When he does this, this is why a lot of individuals just thought that 
Socrates was trying to trick them. Um, so it's easy uh, to think of the method that he's employing, you know, this, this dialectic, this method of questioning, this method of testing for consistency. It, it's easy to see what he's doing as just trying to engage in a bunch of rhetorical tricks um, for some reason. So the idea here is that it was easy for his contemporaries at the time to think that for whatever reason, Socrates was just trying to get over on them for some purpose, whether it was to improve his reputation um, in the eyes of his contemporaries or, you know, for some kind of financial incentive or something like that. And, and this actually comes up in the Apology at Socrates' trial. Um, Socrates just says, okay, so I've, I've been charged, you know, one of the crimes he's charged with is making inferior arguments seem superior, you know, and he says, well, it, it seems that I'm being charged here with, with actively trying to deceive people, but, but clearly I would only knowingly deceive somebody if I were trying to get something out of it. So please tell me what I'm getting out of it. I mean, I'm, I'm poor. I'm old. He was a he was a teacher, but he wasn't a professional teacher. Meaning that historically, Socrates was not paid for his in instruction. He would just instruct whoever was willing to listen. This was not the case with other individuals um, in society. I mean, even Euthyphro, as a religious expert, would have sort of charged fees for instruction um, on the nature of the gods. Um, so Socrates says, all right, well, well, if I'm engaging in deception and, and, and making inferior arguments seem superior intentionally, then show me what I'm getting out of it. Like, like if, if I'm being devious, then clearly I'm being devious so that I can get something out of it. But nobody can show me what I'm getting out of it. Okay, well, um, so if I'm making inferior arguments seem superior, I'm not doing it intentionally. Why? Because there's no evidence that I'm being devious here. Well, that must mean that I'm doing it unintentionally. Now, but if I'm if I'm doing it unintentionally, uh, then the correct course of action is not prosecution. The correct course of action is instruction. So, if somebody's going to tell me that you know what I'm saying or what I'm teaching is mistaken or incorrect, please correct me. Please show me the error of my ways. Please take me under your tutelage, and I will gladly stand corrected. Now, but of course, none of his contemporaries can actually give an explanation for how uh, he's doing this or, or why what he's saying is actually wrong. Now, and what Socrates actually says here in the Apology is this. He says, you know, I, I question everybody. Um, either people who claim to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable or claim to be wise or individuals whom I think wise. Now, and when it is discovered that they are not, I point it out to them on their behalf. Why? You can't correct problems that you're not aware of. So this is why testing for consistency, consistent belief, and using language consistently plays into this. Why is this so important? Well, for Socrates, this is why it's important. Socrates thinks that all manner of vice and injustice and everything else that is bad and evil stems from ignorance, like this guy. So what is so bad about ignorance? And ignorance is like a cancer to the soul. It, it's a literal disease of the soul. And Socrates is convinced, and even Plato and Aristotle pick up on these kinds of themes, that people don't do the wrong thing knowingly or willingly. We do wrong things because we think of them as being good. So, and, and again, this comes up in the Euthyphro Dialogue, this comes up in the Republic. Um, you know, in the Euthyphro Dialogue, Euthyphro and Socrates are talking about murder. And, you know, Euthyphro says, wait, are, are you saying there's anybody who thinks murderers shouldn't be punished? Is that what you're saying, Socrates? And Socrates says, no, 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 no. It, it, it's, it's not a matter of, of course, everyone thinks murderers ought to be punished. Everybody thinks that. But where we disagree is on what actually constitutes murder and what specific kinds of actions count as murder. So if we knew that, then if we all knew that, then 
there wouldn't be any disagreement. But the reason why there's disagreement is because people are ignorant. So everybody wants to live well, but who knows how to live well? Everybody wants to be just, but who actually possesses knowledge of what is just? You know, show me the just individual, says Socrates. So if we knew what was truly good and we knew what was truly just, then we would be virtuous and we would be just. But the reason why we go astray is not because we knowingly or willingly do things that are wrong. We've, we've got the incorrect views about what the good, the just, the noble, the beautiful, and the virtuous are. So if you're ignorant, of course Socrates is going to point it out to you. Why? Because ignorance is not bliss. It, you know, there, there's no such thing as far as Socrates is concerned. There's no such thing as harmless ignorance. All ignorance is harmful to a certain degree. Now, and when ignorant people, people who claim to have knowledge, actually don't possess knowledge, but other people give them high esteem and other people follow their views. I mean, we've got, we've got the ignorant leading the ignorant here. So even if you're a, a big wig, sort of popular, you know, a pop intellectual in Athens, if, if it turns out that you don't know what you're talking about, of course, Socrates is going to point that out, not only for your sake, but for the sake of the individuals that are following you, you know, the, for the sake of the cult of personality. Here. Now, so in the Apology, Socrates, you know, Socrates accuses his accusers of doing this kind of thing. He accuses the people bringing him to trial of doing the very thing that they're accusing him of, making inferior arguments seem superior and, you know, trying to corrupt the youth of Athens, as it were. Okay, so Socrates does not think that we should ask questions just for the sake of asking questions. That's, that's why this is not sophistry. You know, philosophy for Socrates is not a, a recreational exercise. Oh, let's, let's get together and argue for the sake of arguing. Well, let's, let's, let's have a debate team, just, then we'll debate everything just for the sake of having a debate. Um, Socrates did not think or would not have thought that that kind of project was worthwhile. Okay. Okay. So that's just a little bit of the um, historical setting here and in the next couple of, we'll probably need at least two videos to do the youth of dialogue but that's fine um in the next couple of videos we'll get into the youth of dialogue